white-hot excitement of the American Motodrome came hand-in-hand hand with near-weekly accidents, and with an ever-rising death toll, wooden saucer racing would not last long. In just four seasons, close to 30 young Motodrome racers had lost their lives along with dozens of spectators. Public outcry and a growing distaste within the industry marked the beginning of the end for the timber tracks almost as soon as they arrived. The first of the American Motodromes, the Los Angeles Coliseum, had only just opened in March 1909, but by September of 1914, the last board of the short, circular wooden motodromes was nailed in place in Omaha, Nebraska. However, motorcycle racing wasn't going anywhere, having established itself as one of America's most thrilling sports. Like the motorcycle itself, the sport of racing continued to flourish alongside a booming industry. Race on Sunday and sell on Monday quickly became the new business model. Still, without the motodromes, promoters were in search of new venues in which to compete, and enthusiasts began lining up at a variety of new events. The small horse tracks that gave birth to motorcycle racing at the turn of the 20th century continued to harbor those hell-bent on speed, evolving eventually into purpose-built flat tracks in the middle teens. These dusty ovals, typically half-mile to one-mile around, began popping up nationwide at local and state fairgrounds, establishing a pillar of the sport which remains today. The popular endurance and reliability runs of the first decade, too, transformed into flat-out, top-speed, no-holds-barred road races, spanning hundreds of miles and putting the riders and machines alike to a grueling test. To further distance itself from the dangerous motodrome races, the Federation of American Motorcyclists sanctioned the country's first Grand Prix-style road race, as organized by the Chicago Motorcycle Club in Elgin, Illinois, on the 4th of July, 1913. The event drew the best riders in the country, including one of America's most loved stars, Charlie Balk, better known at the time simply as Fearless. Charlie Balk had been a hero of the dirt track and the motodrome since 1908, but since the deaths of fellow racing icons Eddie Hasha, and Balk's mentor, Jacob DeRozier. The young champion had been on a year-long hiatus for much of the 1912 and 1913 season. The new 250-mile Grand Prix at Elgin was just the motivation the struggling racer needed to get back in the saddle. Excelsior, Indian, Flying Merkel, Jefferson, and Pope were among the manufacturers who fielded teams at the race. Once again, in protest to organized competition, Harley-Davidson declined to compete. Over 11,000 spectators made the trip to Elgin for the event on the 4th of July, 1913, but countless others couldn't leave Chicago due to a power outage from the intense heat that day. Professional stars like Ray Seymour, Carl Gowdy, Billy Tubner, Edwin Baker, better known as Cannonball, and Speck Warner each lined up. Riding once again for Indian motorcycles, it was Charlie Balk who completed the 255-mile race in a shade over four and a half hours, an average speed of 55 miles per hour to win. Balk's teammates secured the top five spots in America's first Grand Prix at Elgin, continuing Indians' long-standing stranglehold on the sport. Soon, long-distance road racing took center stage in America, with Grand Prix events upwards of 300 miles long forming in Savannah, Venice, and Dodge City, Kansas. Though Indian had fielded a stable of riders for a few years, this era of road racing brought about the first factory racing programs, with large, well-equipped teams competing across the country. It was a period of significant transition as the increasingly high-level competition from the most prominent manufacturers contributed to an atrophy of American motorcycle manufacturers. Those who fared well in the sport, like Merkel, Thor, Excelsior, and the mighty Indian, enjoyed prominent status in the marketplace. Those who couldn't keep up, or were more specialized in their production, like Henderson, Bradley, and Yale, were finding it hard to stay viable in the condensing marketplace. From its headquarters in Milwaukee, Harley-Davidson built its foothold on the culture away from the racetrack. But in an era of intensified competition, the motor company finally turned its eye toward the sport. Building a factory racing program required specialized skills, and though Harley's engineering department was not lacking in 1913, the company acquired an expert in William Ottaway, a talented engineer and tuner from the Thor Company. Ottaway wasted no time developing a racing platform based on Harley's 1914 Model 10 production V-Twin. 
initially designated the 11K series, the new factory racing Harley-Davidsons were tested throughout the 1914 season with a handful of unofficial competitors. After a mediocre debut at the 1914 Dodge City 300, Ottaway's 11K began holding its own, capturing regional wins and national victories in Phoenix and Birmingham. Finally, on Thanksgiving Day 1914, Harley-Davidson fielded their first factory racing team at the 300-mile road race in Savannah, Georgia, where rider Irving Jank placed third. In just over a year since Ottaway was recruited, the potential of the Harley-Davidson factory racing program had been realized. Increasing funding led to an expanded team of riders for the 1915 racing season, and the machines were further refined. Harley-Davidson started the season strong with a first and second place finish at the Venice 300 on April 4th. By 1915, the Dodge City 300 had become America's preeminent motorcycle race, and the Harley-Davidson factory team made a clean sweep of first through seventh places, the only exception being Excelsior's Carl Gowdy in third. It was that same year, 1915, that the Motodrome era had come to an end but its DNA would soon re-emerge at a massive new scale in Chicago with the completion of the world's first wooden superspeedway. An industry had crystallized over the first decade of motorcycle racing in the United States, but as the golden age of racing matured, a new force was rapidly rising to the top, one of American motorcycle racing's greatest legacies, the Harley-Davidson Wrecking Crew. 